Hey guys, good morning. Um, I'm Carmen Lamoureux. I'm the one of the lead instructors for the Verge Permaculture Design Certification course. And today we're here at my property, the Urban Farm Permaculture Project in Calgary, Alberta, Zone 3. So uh, today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour of my property and show you some of the various elements we've integrated into our design. And uh, we'll touch on those in more detail in future videos. So hopefully you stay tuned for that. So uh, I run a company here in Calgary called Urban Farms school. We teach all kinds of courses around resiliency and uh, and building food security and permaculture and so on. So I'm really thrilled to share my property with you today. So let's get going. So come on into my my uh, my front yard at the landscape. So we transitioned this uh, typical urban uh, landscape from grass, a full-on grass system, to this wonderful ecology that we are blessed to spend time in now. And that was only, we only started that process just a little uh, under five years ago. So we're really thrilled with how far along this, this system has come. One of our main uh, goals with our design in the front yard was about inviting inquiry into what we were doing. So we wanted to create that sort of zone of interaction between public space, which is the street side and the and the uh, sidewalk, and our private space. So we created this, this wonderful entryway into the space that is basically the only remnant of grass that's left on the front yard property. So one of our strategies was to build this wonderful big pergola structure. We wanted to use this almost as another layer in our food forest system here. Now this isn't a densely planted food forest as far as canopy goes. We really definitely wanted a very open uh, system and so we're using the structure basically as a support for our vines but also as, as a structure that really does invite inquiry. When people see this they drive into the cul-de-sac or they walk past with their dogs or they you know, they, uh, they come by on their bicycles and they're just really curious because they know something different is going on here and that's what we want to know. So let's move forward through the system. And as we're coming up here, we've got uh, lots of, um, this is sort of a newer developed area here that we recently dug out a bunch of old uh, plants that were not doing well and replaced them. So it's still a little bare, but it's coming along. We've got this central system here that was really built around this uh, mature birch tree, white birch tree. And so we built a number of layers into this system that allow us to really nurture pollinators and bring a ton of beauty and productivity into our space. So we've got lots of, you know, currants, red currants, black currants, jasta berries, some, um, some hascaps in here, lots of culinary herbs that can take the heat in the front yard, as well as lots of plants that support our pollinator friends. So that's something that's going on in that central area. On this side here, we've got a, a, a huge planting that is basically centered around this apple tree. So this is a fall red apple. We've built a number of uh, layers in here. They all function in different ways for this to support this apple tree. And uh, we made a, a big decision a, year, a number of years ago to remove a, a mature spruce tree from this area. So it was a 50 year old tree and it was definitely starting to fail. But above and beyond that, we knew what kind of system we wanted to create in our front yard, and that spruce tree really didn't support our vision, so we made the tough decision to take it down. And, and that was a tough decision for me. I'm a forester by trade, so I, I love trees. But, uh, but uh, you know, we also made the decision that we were going to purchase as large of a tree as we could afford to replace it. And that was this fall red. Now this tree has been in here for just five years. It is absolutely stunning and it anchors our design and brings this sense of abundance into the space. So we were able to move fairly quickly with getting in nitrogen fixers and, and um, ground covers and medicinal plants and food producing plants. We've got these beautiful alpine currants in here that are just fantastic. We've got uh, globe caraganas for nitrogen fixing. We've got hascaps in here, rhubarb, Egyptian walking onions, all kinds of wonderful plants that also support pollinators. So it's a very, very active system in here. And um, yeah, we've made some, some, some choices in here that have really, really worked super well. So as we go up our pathway here, we're going to encounter this funky, interesting structure here. So this is our, our insect hotel, 
Christian likes to call it the, the holiday insect or the bee, bee and bee. So we designed this particular structure um, to fulfill a number of purposes. One, we wanted a sculptural element in our garden. Uh, and number two, we wanted obviously to support uh, solitary insect species. And it's really wonderful because you can see that already this year, a number of them have emerged. So they come in here and they lay a uh, single larvae and then and then it, they plug it up. You can see this one is still plugged. There's not, not no emergence there yet. A lot of these smaller ones, the big ones we notice they don't really populate. So that, that was a learning curve for us. But these medium sized and small ones in the springtime, we'll see the emergence of a number of beneficial insects in here. So this is a lot of fun. And the other thing we wanted to do was create a bit of a screen between our property and the neighbor's driveway. So that performs multiple functions for us. Plus, we've got a lovely place to sit here and be in the landscape. And that is something that, you know, for me as a, you know, as a designer, I, I, I don't want to just stand back and look at a pretty landscape. I need to be in it. And so all of my designs incorporate elements that draw people into their landscape. And that's super important, I think. So this was one of those strategies uh, that has worked incredibly well. And in fact, our neighbors, if they see us sitting out here, they'll come out and join us too. So sometimes we sit out here for a glass of wine in the evening and, and, and we have, we have uh, company coming. That's just lovely. So we enjoy that, uh, that way of, of community connection with our front yard, which is wonderful. So now we're moving into this area here. This is also a lot of pollinator support in this area, various species that aren't even quite up yet. It's still early spring here. Um, but there's a lot of medicinals. So this is basically a medicinal guild in here centered around a, a, an Evans cherry. And we've got some water here just for our pollinators. Uh, it's a nice safe area for them to get water. There's no moving water here. Here we've got, if we turn around this way, you can see almost the back side of this circle garden centered around the birch tree. So we've had a lot of fun messing around in here because we, I wanted to see um, just how well uh, aromatic pest confuser species actually functioned. So the big experiment was, can I use these species to deter rabbits and deer, which we get a lot of in our yard. We, 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 in the past, we always had a small herd of deer um, overnighting in our front yard, which is really, they used to even jump the back fence in the backyard. So I wanted to experiment, you know, I'm teaching food forestry, I'm teaching all about these various roles and functions in the landscape. And so I thought, let's, let's put this to the test, shall we? So, so I planted a little, a little, uh, <laughs> basically a forest of chives here. Some of the, most of these are giant chives. Uh, and then I planted basically the salad bar species for rabbits and um, and deer, which are hostas. They just love those, um, and those are wonderful edible for us as well. And then on the other side of those, I planted uh, nipita, which is a cat mint. So this is a variety called Walker's Low. It'll actually get quite a bit wider, be covered in beautiful lavender blossoms that the pollinators absolutely adore. But it, it it's it's got a strong mint scent if you brush up against it. So one morning we came out and a bunch of the catmint over there had been smushed down and there was a pile of deer poop on the, on the back end. So we knew that a deer had over, overnighted in the front yard and had laid down there and had his butt at that end and his nose at this end and he must have been right on top of those hostas and he couldn't smell them, right? So he couldn't eat them. He didn't eat them. He didn't even know they were there because there was so much aroma in the air. So we realized, you know, we laugh, we say it was like the, um, we offered the B&B, &B, you know, the bed and breakfast, but he only stayed for the bed portion and kind of skipped out on breakfast. He left early. So it's, it's, it works really, really well in our landscape. We'll also use, um, we'll also use species like perennial mints and garlic chives and, um, and Egyptian walking onions and anything, anything in the allium family as a deterrent, because we do get a lot of deer coming through here. On, on the other hand, um, it's not that I want to keep the deer necessarily out. This was basically an experiment to see how well aromatic pest confuser species worked. But in the actual fact, since we don't have animals in our system, managed animals, we don't have any micro livestock at this point, one strategy that I do use is planting specific things of which I have plenty, like kale. I always grow way too much kale. And I will strategically plant kale in my garden 
knowing that the rabbits and the deer are going to come in and every time they eat they leave a deposit of nitrogen behind and so that's one way that I'm actually working with these patterns these wildlife patterns through my property and utilize optimizing their use to make nitrogen deposits into my landscape because everything else in in here they're not really interested in so if I give them a little teaser plant they'll come in and do some um, ecological services for me so I really like that over here we've got um, some little beds that we built a number of years ago again in response to uh, a lot of folks inquiries around how to grow food um, and, and, and manage the wildlife as well. So we don't really need this extra growing space. We've got tons in the backyard, but this was just a really simple system we came up with. Small beds with these really lightweight wire covers and we could, many years we were growing spinach and lettuces in here because it doesn't get full on sun all day. So they really enjoyed this spot. But this year we decided to use it in a, in a, in a perennial way using strawberries so we've got some ever bearing strawberries in here so I mean if your front yard is your sunny spot and that's your most productive zone and you do have wildlife pressure this is a system that works incredibly well like I said these are very lightweight they're not difficult to make and uh, and they function extremely well the nice thing is you can water right through them so so that's really great and then uh, let's just move back through towards the backyard so we've made a few changes actually here this year. We used to have a pathway here. Um, but we realized that we were getting so many good solar resources. This whole area used to be in shade because the, the, the neighbors had three massive spruce trees on, on their property. And so uh, it was very shady in here. A pathway seemed the best use of the space. There was really nothing going on here. Uh, but when they took out those three spruce trees, suddenly we ended up with all of these solar resources. So we decided to actually fill in the pathway. So now we have a small cherry tree here and a lot of um, um, alliums and some pollinator friendly species that are taking up this space here. And we've been able to also um, optimize the use of our front uh, driveway as well. So we're still in the process of working this out and uh, experimenting with different kinds of things to just increase the productivity in this area. So it's a it's an area that we're using. We'll talk about the front yard uh, driveway garden in a future video. So let's move over this way. So now we also have this area which is also brand new in our property. We used to have a number of um, tall columnar aspens in here. Um, they were having some disease issues, but they were also incredibly vampiric when it came to water, the use of water. So, uh, so we decided to change things up a little bit. And this is this looks very managed and um, non permy like. But for now, once it gets overgrown a little bit more, we're going to start to see a lot more uh, magic happening in here. But for now, this is uh, this is what's working out here. We've got a multi plum. Uh, three, three different species of plums here in this tree. So we're excited to see how that's going to work out. I'm, I love plums, so it's great. So. And more perennial beds here. The asparagus is just going nuts. Don't you just love these? So we're going to leave some of these to fern out. Um, these are crowns that I just put in last year. So some of these, we'll harvest about 30% of those and uh, leave the rest to fern up so that the plant can gain more vitality and we've got a raspberry bed here with garlic growing in it so yeah these little they're really robust so we're looking forward to a really great harvest of, of raspberries this year so let's go through the garden gate yeah. this is our side yard so this actually used to be where my greenhouse stood. Sorry, I'm gonna walk in front of the camera. This is where my greenhouse, my old greenhouse used to be. Um, but as you can see, there are quite tall lilac bushes up there and, uh, and the solar resources in that. Greenhouse were diminishing rapidly, plus it had been up for, well, almost 25 years and I think it was only the fence that was holding it up. But this is kind of a unique area. We're going to discuss um, why that is in a future video. But as you can see, we've got water here as a welcoming feature. 
Also, we get a lot of sparrows and so on uh, and chickadees that are nesting in these areas here. So we wanted to make sure that they um, had a place to access water. We've got some additional growing beds here. Um, this is an area that only gets about five hours of sunlight a day, but we're able to get massive production off this area. Um, and I, as I mentioned, it's a unique zone. We'll talk about that in a future video, but um, the corn will actually also just go nuts in this area. So it's really, really a, a fantastic sweet spot in our yard. So it's not planted out yet, but it will be shortly. And now we're looking at this massive structure. It's a support structure. It actually, it's a structure that performs multiple important functions for us. Right now, there's no netting on top, but this is our hail protection structure for our tall crops. It provides support for our super tall crops like our pole beans, um, our indeterminate tomatoes. Uh, I grow a variety of peas called alderman peas, and they will grow eight feet tall uh, or more, actually. So those are these that are already uh, well on their way this year. So this structure has proven um, incredibly invaluable for us. Uh, we can grow any of our tall crops here without any worry regarding um, hail damage. So in our area here, we get a ton of hail and, uh, and it's, it's, it's not unheard of to lose your entire annual vegetable garden in one, uh, you know, 10 minute hail event. So we did want to minimize the chance of that happening in this area. So this is what we did, and it's been a wonderful experiment. This way, our old Amir maple, she's just hanging in there after so many years and, uh, you know, doing what we love this tree. Over here we've got um, basically an area that is mostly utility. This is our uh, 4,000 liter rainwater harvesting uh, setup here. I'm going to show you. Now, in an urban environment, um, and we'll discuss this also in a future video, aesthetics are, you know, are, can be somewhat important, especially if you're trying to spread the word about, you know, ecological systems. So we created these covers that basically just sit on a, on the hooks here. So easy to remove. Um, this is just landscape fabric covering. This is how we initially we, we, we covered our totes. But, uh, but we really love this system. We've had a lot of people comment on it and uh, whoops, copy it, which we're happy about. But it's a system we really like. So we've got 4,000 liters here. We've got another probably uh, maybe 750 between the two garages. And we're getting ready to install another big 1,000 liter tote at the side of the house. So we have certainly enough water to manage our growing systems here, which is really, really great. Now we're entering into sort of the main garden area. So that over there was a side garden. This is the main garden. And uh, we've got a number of four foot, roughly four, 40 inches or so by 10 foot long uh, raised beds that we grow most of our storage crops for the season. And uh, a lot of these, because we do a ton of canning and preserving. And so we want to have the resources available to, to do that, to plan for winter, because our winters are so long here. So one of the strategies in cold climates is that we really need to start thinking about how do we manage our food sources for the winter months. And often that it revolves around, you know, growing storage crops. And so I'm always experimenting with different species or different uh, varieties, I'm sorry, uh, to find out which ones store the best. So. Uh, and they have to have, you know, have a short enough season that we can accomplish um, maturity within that season. So one of the ways we build more resilience into our property is actually making sure we've got plenty of pollinator species surrounding all of our growing systems. So this is a bed that is just full of species that are basically designed primarily for pollinators, also for beauty. And many plants perform multiple functions. You look at uh, plants like oregano, which are incredibly attractive to pollinators. Really love them, absolutely love them. Plus it's a, it's a aromatic pest confuser species and it's an edible for us. So, and, and considered a medicinal as well. So we, we're always looking for those kinds of plants in our systems and we utilize them extensively. So we're gonna go into the garden itself. Oh, it's lo lovely. The blossoms are actually falling from the apple trees. So we're going to move in 
to the garden itself and start um, just looking at kind of some of the things we've already got going on. So here in a short season, we have to start early. We have to start thinking very proactively when it comes to uh, getting enough abundance out of our short season. So we do start a lot of our plants from seed uh, early on in the season, starting as early as, as January. These onions and leeks, for example, were seeded in January under lights and they come out as, as small seedlings and in the early spring when they, when they come out and they start to grow really well at that point. And we're getting, you know, the spinach were sown probably about a month ago or so. Um, so we're always thinking about how to get plants into the ground at the right time, get them seeded early. No way do we wait to the main long weekend to, to plant our plants. That, that only applies to your, hot, your warm season crops. Most of your cool season crops are well on their way. Look at this broccoli here. I've got three different varieties of broccoli so that I'm going to get maturity at different stages. But look at how robust and healthy these guys are. They were started in, um, in mid-March and then planted out here about uh, three weeks ago or so. Same with the kale. So the kales and things, these are things we rely on. So we want, we want to have a, a really robust uh, system that allows us to, you know, not wait till the very end of the season to harvest, right? When it's you're like really loaded with uh, harvesting and preserving at the end of the season, we want to make sure that we're able to do that throughout the season. So broccoli is one of those crops that um, we consider it an early crop and we'll follow this up with late season spinach and, and lettuces and other greens as well. So we're able to get uh, multiple yields off of, off of uh, one bed, which is great. So um, back in this area here, we've got a little seating area. This is one of my favorite early morning coffee spots. It's also an area where we store some of our um, our, our panels for the garden for hail protection. So let's move this way. You can see I've integrated flowers into my gardens. I really, I really love that. I, you know, I used to not grow any annuals whatsoever uh, for the garden, but I realized that I really love. It's very cheery to me to to see uh, to see annuals in the garden, and they can perform beautiful functions in here. In this case, um, actually, maybe we'll talk about that in a future video. There's just there's so much going on here, and and it's uh, difficult to get it all in in one one video. So, um, so yeah, you know, since I have a growing setup in my garage anyway. I just start a bunch of annuals from seed. It saves me a ton of money. I don't have to buy anything from the garden center and it brings me so much happiness and joy to see the flowers in the spring. This way. So this is our main family gathering zone over here. We've got a big long table that we our family gets together. We've got this beautiful space over here that uh, actually we're really, we use this space so much. This actually used to be the least usable area in our garden because it was a massive deck here. And this was the spot where we put all the crap that we didn't want other people to see. Um, it was where we had our compost bins. It was a utility zone. But after we took the deck out and we started to really, this was like 25 years ago, we really started to pay attention to the various um, areas of our garden to try to maximize each space to its highest potential and uh, in the at the end of the day we realized that where when do we have time to sit outside it's in the evening and so what's beautiful is that in the in the early spring the sun is still low enough that it comes into this space and provides a beautiful little sun trap in this zone so we can sit here and warm our old bones and you know sit down with a glass of wine and, and enjoy ourselves in that in that late afternoon um, you know dinner time hour which is lovely but now the sun is high enough in the sky that this area remains in shade during most of the day so this is our go-to area now so the least you know valuable portion of our property is now you know one of the places that we spend a lot of our time in so that just really goes to illustrate how when you when you do follow the permaculture design process and you start to you know really place a lot of importance on the observational 
uh, stages that you can gain a lot and glean a lot of insights about how best to utilize every single corner of your property. We'll talk a little bit about that in a future video as well. So this has become just our, our happy zone here, which is great. So we're going to move uh, through into this area here. And now what we've done in this area is we've basically surrounded this small little grass patch uh, with, with food for us all the way around. So we've got these old mature crab apple trees, which how beautiful they're dropping their blossoms today. They just are so, so lovely and robust. So we have so much food in here. It is absolutely unbelievable. We've got a small fountain there. We've got four or five big pass gaps there, four or five josta berries. We've got a, um, a, a, a plum tree, another plum tree, a pear tree, Saskatoons, goji berries, rhubarb. Um, what else have we got here? Well, we've got raspberries back here, asparagus, strawberries, alpine strawberries everywhere in the understory, thymes, all kinds of edibles in here. It's just, it's just packed, just packed with edibles. And yet it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's performing like a real ecosystem. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see uh, with, with just a little bit of thought and, and intention in your design that you can create incredible abundance on your property. We just love that. So this is a very, also a very unique area in our yard here we, where we're growing black Wyoming raspberries. These are a variety that is uh, low suckering to no suckering. We've got asparagus growing in here, a few different varieties and strawberries. But what's interesting about this area because of our orientation is that this area hardly gets any sunlight. It might get two hours a day of direct sun. So when we think about the amount of abundance we get out of this little corner, now if we were in full sun for eight to 12 hours a day, it would go through the roof. But the fact is, is that even though we're not getting that kind of sunlight, we're still getting some production. And that's meaningful to us, you know, just don't you know, don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because you don't have, you know, the required or, you know, ideal eight hours of sunlight that you can't grow food. So we're proving that that's, um, that's a myth and uh, we're able to get a ton of production off of this area. That goji berry bush in the back <laughs> produces so many goji berries. It's just, just amazing. And, uh, and a lot of that comes down, I believe, to the fact that we take a lot of care with our soil health. So uh, we're able to optimize the use of the space based on that. So we're moving now into what we used to call the back 40. Um, this is an area that was really unusable. In fact, this area here used to be where we had our fire pit when the kids were little. But when these trees started to really mature and get bigger, we decided a fire pit here wasn't a good idea anymore. So how are we gonna use this space? So what we did is we, we uh, actually created a little serenity zone back here. So this is a, an area now we call Gaia's Garden. And, uh, and that pile of soil there behind that little tree is really uh, old sod, basically. This is, we used to call it Sod Mountain in here. So it, uh, it has created this lovely little hidey hole space that, uh, that we'll also talk about in a later video. Here is uh, a little experiment on healing soil. In this area here, this is a pile of soil that came out of that pathway in my main garden. It used to be just a, you know old boards that I'd step on and uh, once we decided to put a permanent pathway in there a lot of the old compacted really messed up soil came out and uh, when my brother and, and uh, Christian asked me where I wanted to put the soil I said let's put it back here in this corner and I'll do an experiment to see. So I had a little rhubarb um, plant that came out of off of one of my other plants and even though this gets, this is the only sunlight that this plant will get for most of this day because of the amount of shade from these big trees. But yet look at the robustness of that, of that plant. It, rhubarb will grow anywhere. So don't be limited by the sun, by what your perceived sunlight requirements are. This is a plant that ideally grows in full sun, but it's still producing beautifully with one or two hours of sunlight a day. It's absolutely amazing. Here we've got some white Dutch clover in here. It's going to help heal the soil and break up some of that compaction and uh, 
basically whatever plants I had extra of I threw in here. I've got some like, ferns that are that are uh, doing well in here and there's some cat mint and there might be some oregano in here and basically I'm utilizing what would have been normally considered a waste resource because the soil was so badly damaged and, uh, and, and making it into a productive space. So again, look at these beautiful alpine strawberries here. They're very, very happy in this environment. They're not needing full sun all day. Look how happy they are. They're not stressed. They, 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 they're just doing beautifully. They don't uh, bloom a ton in this location, but you can see there's, they're, they're, they will produce some berries. Um, so I'm using that basically as a border plant in here. Lots of creeping times and that sort of thing. So now we're entering into this uh, other unique little spot. We're going to talk about this in a future video. This is basically um, a garden that I like to call my little woodland garden because it is centered around these two old crab apple trees. So I've created a couple of um, apple tree guilds in here as teaching tools for my students. But mostly I wanted to be able to be in this landscape under this beautiful canopy. So I just created this very informal little pathway here and, and, and planted the plants that I knew were going to do well. There's so much food in here, even though it's a, a more shady location. And right now when the sun um, is, is quite low in the sky this morning, um, this is the only time this area receives sunlight. So you can look at the lushness in here and how happy everybody is. So lots of different species in here, but it's actually become just one of my favorite spots in the whole yard because it's not all about creating abundance in sunlight. Beautiful little okay, um, Saskatoon here that's doing quite well. Another uh, strategy we like to do is show small space growing solutions. I mean, we're really fortunate. We have a good sized uh, pie shaped lot, very generous size, but a lot of folks don't. They've got really small spaces. So we like to trial out different different uh, strategies for small space growing, such as these sort of petite cherry trees. So we've got this one here, which is a carmine jewel and another one called uh, crimson passion. And we love these trees. They'll, this one is about as tall as it's going to get. It might get a tiny bit wider but it's a great solution for growing fruit in a small space. So we really like these little trees. They're really great. So if we turn around here, this is just abutting the actual uh, main garden here. We've got a little herb spiral. So this is so funny. This has been here, oh, for so long now, but it, it probably started out this tall, my mound of soil. And just over the years, it settled because what I did is I built a hoogle culture underneath here. I actually put old decaying pieces of wood underneath the soil mound but over time of course over the number of years this has been here it's, it started to depress and so on. So a little fountain here. So um, yeah we just we have a lot of fun. We just try all kinds of stuff. We've got beets growing in here and this will get planted out shortly. This is our little greenhouse. I'm not going to get into too much detail about this. We're going to do another one in another video, but um, this is a better location for us. We're just getting ready to transplant our tomatoes and peppers in here, so I have a bit of soil prep to do yet, um, and, uh, and we'll be good to go. Just leave those doors open, I think, so it's getting a little warm already in here. Yeah, so that's basically our property, our garden. We haven't looked at the back alley yet, but we'll do that in the another video when we talk about composting. So, so, so happy to have welcomed you into my space and uh, happy to share uh, all the crazy stuff that we're doing here. And we enjoy this and what we love about, about what we do is that we really have created a lifestyle for ourselves and our property. And we've allowed our property to demonstrate its love for us as well. So creating these beautiful nurturing spaces that allow us to live and grow and learn together with natural systems. So, so thanks for letting me uh, share my space with you.